So sitting comfortably, elongating the spine. And beginning to bring ourselves inwards. We have the sensation that we can feel our bodies from the inside. And maybe you can notice the inner vibration. Notice if it's feeling calm and attentive, or if it has any edge of anxiety or restlessness or dullness or heaviness or anything else. We're not trying to judge. We're just trying to see what is there. And then we're going to notice our breathing. So just our natural breathing pattern, natural at the moment, because it's always changing. Again, without any judgment, just learning to notice what is actually happening within. slowly start to manipulate manipulate our breath by making the inhales and the exhales a little longer but also the same length and if you know ujjayi you can use the sound of ujjayi and the closing of the the partial closing of the vocal cords to make that sound Feeling how the rib cage is moving in three di directions as we breathe in and as we breathe out. So it moves forward and back, side to side, up and down, especially when we start to deepen the breath. start to bring our breathing rhythm together so everybody does an exhale so exhale completely from the bottom inhaling exhaling ujjayi inhaling Exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. At the end of this exhale, you're going to retain the breath. You can use Jalandhara Bandha. So retain.
inhaling exhaling and retain Jalandhara Bandha Inhaling, exhaling, retaining, inhaling, Exhaling normally with Ujjayi. Inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling. Exhaling. Inhaling. Exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, we're going to retain at the end of this inhale, retain, Exhale. Inhale. Retain. Exhale. Inhale. Retain. Exhale, inhaling, no retention, exhale, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, Exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. And then slowly bringing your breath back to your own natural rhythm. And bring the palms. 
palms in front of the chest. And you can rub the hands together, warming up the palms. And placing them over the eyes. Opening the eyes behind the palms. And slowly releasing the hands. So here we are again. Oh, I better start with the right sutra. I'm starting with my last sutra. So last week we had seen some of the prerequisites to attaining samadhi. Um, what was my note? I have a note there. Another way that some say, um, yeah, some say that um, that those are that this. What we're going to talk about next is a more direct way of sign, finding samadhi, or a quicker way, which is Sutra one point two three. So one point twenty three. Ishvara, Lord or God. Pranidadad, devotion or dedication, va, or. Could also translate Ishvara as supreme consciousness. So they say that this is quicker than what we talked about last week. So this is, or samadhi is near through devotion to the Lord. Okay, so if we can have complete devotion to the Lord, then we're going to have it a little quicker than all those things we talked about last week, which are simple but hard, right? And same with this. This sounds like, okay, so if I just give everything, offer it all up. Has anybody ever tried that? Like for a couple of weeks that every time something is going on like good or bad you try to offer it up i've tried this and i've had sticky notes around and i still forget <laughs> so it's really hard because <laughs> even with my sticky notes when i feel frustrated my computer's not working i get all frustrated oh yeah okay offer it up offer it up offer it up <laughs> so i know it's really really hard so um Let's talk about this word God, because before we even talk, I'm going to say that I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, you know, like talking about God feels a little bit to me like out of my realm, but because I've promised to do these sutras start to finish, at least till a little bit into the third pada. After that, I get a little bit even more and more confused. So I'll see how far along we go. But as I've committed, I'm sitting here, I'm talking about something that I feel like I'm not 100% qualified for. Okay, so I put that out there first. Because to talk about God, I don't know. This is like, whoo, this is really big. Um, so I'm giving you my little insights or intuitions so this word god i feel like some it's very loaded it's a very loaded word it's led to much dispute through our ages you know as far back as we have history the word god has brought war and dispute and controversy and all these kind of negative things and this is why one of the reasons why when I started yoga, in fact, I didn't want to hear anything about this kind of philosophy because I had seen it in my own, from my own family and house and how it was just like, what is that? You know, it didn't make much sense. So um, it took me a while to kind of get into this idea of a God. 
And because I think I grew up with God having, you know, a white old man with a white long beard and this uh, kind of stereotype of who God was. And it first, first it's a man, second now it's white, you know, and so all these kinds of things that are just like, what? So um, I didn't really identify with it. But then actually, as I started doing yoga and going inwards and studying more, then I started to get a maybe a broader meaning to this word right and then I felt more comfortable about it and this is why I've really enjoyed the Patanjali Yoga Sutras because there doesn't he doesn't say God has this particular name Ishvara is just something a general name for you know the the Lord or something beyond us and we'll see because when we see the qualities of Ishvara you'll see that it could be applied to any religion anybody feels devoted to. So you don't have to give up your religion to be able to study the Yoga Sutras. In other words, if you're Catholic or um, Islamic or Jewish or, I don't know, Buddhist, you can still study these. So I feel like we can use these teaching, teachings to complement whatever we identify with. You know, Hindu, I didn't say Hindu. <laughs> Sorry, missed that one. Um, so we can use it to identify with whichever God we, we believe in. So, um, and as we um, feel about, intuit about, you know, I don't want to say look about because that only comes through our senses. But when we intuit the world around us, we can feel that it's clear there's, definitely an inherent something there's really something beyond what we can feel like i mean feel with our hands touch smell see um, even look at it through a microscope so um, there's definitely an intelligence behind this universe what this intelligence is i think as we'll see what patanjali says Really, most of us, I think none of us know, maybe a very small percentage of uh, highly enlightened beings know what that is, but us, anybody coming to listen to me talk, I don't think uh, I would uh, be of interest to you. And uh, me living as a yoga teacher in a town, in a city, this isn't the kind of thing that I think... Um, you know, there's debates on that as well. So um, how does it all keep going? How does this ball sit floating in space, right? That already gives us an indication there's something, you know, really magical beyond anything that we can imagine. Um, so you could call it supreme consciousness, reality, God, truth, love with a capital L, divine, ultimate knower, intelligence behind the intelligence. So those are just some of the things that I, there's some of the words that I like to use for myself and whatever else you have. So I wanted to read, um, this is from Ramana Maharishi. So it's an excerpt from his book, called Talks with Ramana Maharishi. If you're really interested in going into Advaita Vedanta, this is, it's my favorite book on earth, like of all books. Um, it's on page 165, if anybody has the book. So I'm just gonna read it out loud. So when you adhere to one philosophical system, you are obliged to condemn the others. Right? So if you believe in one and you really, you are really adhering to that, then you're already somehow saying the others are opposing, right? So all people cannot be expected to do the same kind of action. Each one acts according to his temperament and past lives. So that's why I gave all those different ways of describing, putting a name to Ishvara, because 
all of them can apply. We don't have to say, well, I think it's the divine. Well, you're wrong. I think it's nature. Well, no, you're wrong because it's, uh, it's God or, you know, some other names. So wisdom, devotion, action are all interlocked. Wisdom, devotion, and action. Yeah, I like that because wisdom, I devote or I surrender and I must act. So I'm here in this earth, I'm an actor. Meditation on forms is according to one's own mind. So when we are going through the stages of samadhi, which are the prerequisites will be pratyahara, like letting, um, cutting off the senses and concentration and then meditation and then samadhi. So we, we usually use a form like, you know, maybe a deity or a candle or um, even an internal mantra or the breath, any of these things, they are all left to our own device. We can decide. Nobody can tell us that this is a better deity than that deity, right? Or the breath is better than a deity or the concentrating on the sense of I am-ness is better than the breath or any of these kinds of things because it all comes back to what is best for us. And we need to listen to this inner guru. So meditation on the forms, on forms is according to one's own mind. It is meant for ridding oneself of other forms and confining oneself to one form. So this, my interpretation is that as we're working through to come to final realization, first we have to clear a lot away. Right? And the way to clear things away is to bring our mind to focus on certain things. Because the way our mind is, it's jumping all over the place. So it's virtually impossible for us to just suddenly come into awakening. Right? You know, I guess, again, we can um, debate that because there's certain sages that, including Ramana Maharishi, that apparently this happened to, but I don't think this is the daily person, it's not us. So first we try to, okay, I'm gonna get rid of those things and I'm gonna bring my mind to this, right? So where was I? It is impossible to fix the mind in the heart to start with. So these aids are necessary initially, okay? Because Ramana, he, the, what, what he was teaching was that the I, I, the sense of I, but the deep I, not I am Linda, I am a woman, I am this, I am that, but the I, I, my essence is where, um, the guru resides or God resides. But then, even once you go to there, then he explains that it isn't really there, it is everywhere, right? Because we need to, us as human beings, we need to first have, we bring our consciousness, our mind inwards, right? On certain focuses, then we get subtler and subtler and we might be able to come to the the i i which is um and i mean i like the capital i not not i <laughs> right um in the heart center and that still gives us a place to bring our our mind to right does that make sense um okay so these aids are necessary initially and so he, he uses the names of Krishna and Arjuna and um, the, the, the gods from the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna says there is no birth. And later he says he was born before Adita. Arjuna disputes, disputes it. So in other words, even in the Bhagavad Gita, he contradicts himself, 
right? So this you'll find in spiritual teachings because of perspective, right? Because we all have to, our different perspective from where we are standing the with our past lives, how much we've evolved, um, how we're looking at things, how we look at the world. And so in these great teachings, the person who wrote them or compiled them has to be able to talk to everybody, no matter where they are on that stage. Okay, so therefore, it is certain that each one thinks of God according to his own degree of advancement. Okay, so I don't know, this kind of just puts chills in me because this sums up everything everybody's been disputing over, you know, for very many years. We don't need to dispute, you know, we just need to be happy with where we are and respect where every single other being is, right? Okay, so um, we continue with Patanjali. So Sutra 1.24. So here Patanjali tries to describe Ishvara. So if you've got your Sutra, it's Klesha, <laughs> which is affliction. So I'm giving different um, translations depending on what I've felt like I kind of feel close to. And I know in each book you will have different um, translations. So afflictions or root causes of suffering. Root causes of suffering. Karma, which are actions. Vipaka, fruition or fruits of our actions, ashayer, which is reservoir or deposits, so the deposits of those fruits of those actions. Um, oh, this one's hard for me. Aparamritta. Aparamritta. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. Anyway, untouched, untouched. Purusha, which is self. We talked about that in another class. Vishesha, special. So the two, Purusha, Vishesha, is supreme soul or a special self. Ishvara, God or Lord or those, all those other words we used. So, translated... In English, Ishvara is a special self untouched by klesha, karma, fruits of actions, or their reservoir. Okay, so the qualities of Ishvara are, it's a special purusha. Purusha, we said, is soul or self, knower, seen, Right? Seen with a capital S, self with a capital S. So this leads to lots of confusion and lots of debate. And this is why I've used Ramana Maharishi's teachings to help me kind of understand because the Yoga Sutras can be viewed as a dualistic teaching or non-dualistic teaching. Ramana Maharishi taught non-dualistic teaching. And depending on the commentator, they will attribute Patanjali to dualistic or non-dualistic. Okay, even um, Georg Fernstein did two commentaries, one from the position of dualist, dualistic and the other from the perspective of non-dualistic. So what they say is that there's a correlation between Ishvara and Purusha. So they're linked somehow, but is not really describing clearly how they're linked. So Ishvara, the Supreme Self, is somehow linked to our individual Purushas. Kind of makes some sense? I hope so. Um, I'll continue a little later. So, kleshas. 
So if you want to do research after the kleshas, you will find them in Sutra 2.3. So if you want to make notes there, I always find referencing back and forth can be handy because we're not going to talk about them in detail because in Sutra 2.3, he lists the kleshas and then from then on for a while, he explains each one individually. So they are avidya, ignorance to knowing our true reality. Asmita, I am-ness, or ego, I am. Raga, attachment. Dvesha, aversion, or dislike. Abhinivesha, clinging to life, clinging to being here. So Ishvara is untouched by these root causes of suffering. Right? So we know there's something beyond that doesn't ever suffer right then the next one um karma and vipaka so ishvara does not act in the world right because we are acting our bodies are acting right our mind is acting but ishvara is not acting in the world so it will not experience the results of these actions the fruitions of the actions, our karmas and our actions, cause and effect, it will not experience those. Okay, so that's another description of Ishvara. Another quality he had, he, uh, I'm trying not to say he. <laughs> yeah, okay, it or Ishvara, just call it Ishvara. Nor does Ishvara accumulate a reservoir of subliminal activators in the unconscious or the chitta. So remember we talked about the subliminal activators, the samskaras, that somewhere all our actions through our current life, through past lives, through the family karma, through the city karma, through the nationality karma, through the race karma, through the world karma, all these different kinds of karmas that we are accumulating. Um, we behave, we think, we talk, we identify because of all these different karmas. And so they say it's like a reservoir of karmas. So somewhere in our chitta, right? And our chitta is comprised of those three, the, um, the ego, the low mind and the high mind, manas and buddhi, right? That's the chitta. Um, so we move around that world kind of being dragged about because of these things. We don't even, our, our, our job, one of our jobs is to be able to be conscious to those subliminal activators. Why do I behave this way? I behave this way because for generations, my greatest grandparents have taught me to behave this way. Right? But it's very, very subtle because we think we're independent of those things, right? We think that somehow what happened 500 years ago, it's over now, it's gone, and it's not affecting us today. But it is. It's all like a chain, but it's so difficult to pinpoint. So Ishvara is not experiencing that. Then we'll go into Sutra 1.25. So, Tatra, so in that, referring to Ishvara, um, so usually it's translated as him or he, he with a capital H. Um, Nirat Ishayam. Not sure if I said that even correctly, remotely correctly, but it means unsurpassed. Sarvajna, all knowing or omniscience. Bijam, seed. Okay, so in that, referring to Ishvara, the seed of omniscience is unsurpassed. So omniscience is 
all knowing. So the seed of all knowing is unsurpassed. Okay, so it is all knowing. Ishvara, the divine, is all knowing. The ultimate reality, truth, this is all knowing. Knows everything we don't know. We ask, why am I here? Who am I? What is this? <laughs> right? But this Ishvara knows all that. So, um, <laughs> Ishvara is neither the Purusha. So this is a quote that I took from, um, I forgot to write it in my notes. Um, it's a quote from Swami Hariharananda in his commentary on the Yoga Sutras. This is a really great commentary because he also translates the um, Vyasa's commentary, which is the first known commentary of the Yoga Sutras. But this quote is from Swami Hariharinanda, not Vyasa. So Ishvara is neither the Purusha principle nor the Pradhana principle, but is made up of both. So it says the exact same thing that Ramana said, right? Do you see that? So Ishvara is neither the Purusha. So it's not the Purusha. It's not the self, right? Our deep self, nor is it the Pradhana, which is the source material of Prakriti or Prakriti, which is nature. So it's neither the self, nor is it nature but it is made up of both. Does that resonate? Right? So basically, Ishva, nature and soul are Ishvara. Right? Ishvara is made up of that, of those. So everything, Prakriti is everything in the universe. It's the earth, it's a tree, it's even a paper or this futon or this wall, even the plastic or a watch, because it is everything, because we tend to see things as, oh, this is man-made, right? But nothing is man-made, right? Doesn't make any sense. Man can't make anything, right? It's all made through the divine, right? So everything that is there is Prakriti. And the Purusha is our individual souls. Okay, so those two are part of Ishvara. I think that is just, I love that, right? Because it means, to me, it means that, um, that Ishvara is all, okay? But it also means that depending on the perspective we take, we can see Prakriti, we can see Purusha, or we can see Ishvara. So I can look and say, I have a soul, right? There is my soul. When I meditate and I go deep, I can feel the essence of who I am. I can look around me, I can go to the forest and I can see what I consider nature, right? But then there's something that binds all this together, which is this higher principle, right? Which is the Ishvara. So then I could look at everything, myself, you, everybody else, and see that all is the divine, depending on the perspective I'm taking. So sometimes I use my hand as a simple exa um, example. So I can look at my hand and say, well, this is a hand. But I can also look at my hand, but no, it's not a hand. It's fingernails, it's skin, it's muscle, it's bone, it's blood vessels, it's fascia. Um, it's a thumb, it's a first finger, it's a middle finger, it's a ring finger, it's a baby finger. So I can look at my hand in all those different ways, or I can just say it's a hand, right? So I can also look around and say everything is the divine. Does that make sense? Does it sound weird? 
<laughs> okay, so um, let's see what's my next note there. So I think um, often there's a lot of talk and a lot of philosophical talk about um, all this kind of thing. We can, you know, philosophically, we can stay in our mind and imagine and talk and talk and talk until, you know, I don't know, till forever. Um, but really, I think what we want to achieve or aspiration or my personal aspiration is that I want to feel connected within, right? I want to feel connected within myself, that I am, I'm able to go inside and feel like you are love, you are the divine, you are worthy of being on this earth, all these kinds of things. But I also want to be connected outwardly because I want to connect with you guys. I want to connect with my family. I want to connect with the earth. I want to connect, connect with the community. I want to connect with the world, this country, you know? So ultimately we want both of these. We want to connect inwardly and outwardly. And this is going to bring us into some sort of feeling of balance. I'm not saying that you ever like, or I don't know, can we ever get full balance, you know, like, uh, it's like homeostasis. This is a balance in our body. It's like, it's always, you know, our temperature, if we're getting too hot, our body will do the things that cools us off. If we're getting too cold, our body will do the things that make us warmer. So it's like, or um, I read another uh, description from, Oh, I forget the name of the, the spiritual leader. Anyway, what he said, uh, Ajahn Chah. Yeah, it was um, Jack Cornfield's teacher. So he said that it's like when you're driving a car, when you're driving down the road, if you're veering a little bit too much, too much to the right, you're going to drive a little bit towards the left. If you're driving too much towards the left, you're gonna drive a little bit towards the right. And this is how you find balance. So I wanna have, I wanna connect inwardly, inwardly, but if I get too connected inwardly, then I can't be part of society, right? It's gonna be hard to connect with others if I'm only inward. But if I connect too much outwardly, then I don't connect with myself. I don't see where I am, who I am, and I might not be able to, not even talking about connecting with the divine, right? Just connecting with what are my, what do I want in this world? What do I wanna do for a living? You know, how do I feel about this relationship? Who do I want to be friends with? What movies do I want to see? You know, these kinds of things, you know, but then even deeper connecting to the divine within. Um, where is my note? I missed something because I also wanted to, yes. Sutra one, two, five, one, two, six. Okay, so. Sutra 126. So the first word, sa, which means that, it's not in every commentary. So I don't really know why, but some of my commentaries have that word and some don't. <laughs> so I'm saying it. Okay, sa, which is that. Uh, pervasham, which means ancients or the ancient ancients. Api, also, guru, which is teacher, kalena, by time, anavachedat, unconditioned or non-limited. So that, referring to Ishvara, being unlimited by time, is also the teacher of the ancients. So it's again describing some of the qualities of Ishvara. It is unlimited by time. So it's always been there. It will always be there. Right? The teacher of the ancient teachers. 
So it's the teacher of the first gurus, the first sages, the wise, the first wise men, right? So I think that it would probably be like the first wise people that connected inside, found enlightenment, and understood what Ishvara is, God, divine, you know, the unlimited uh, reality, understood this, and then came and started teaching it. And then this teaching goes through the ages. I personally think that, they, not saying that they didn't achieve that, but I also believe that we are improving as a world. We're improving as human beings, that we're getting more and more wise. Doesn't always seem like this, <laughs> but I do think this is happening. And that we use the wisdom of the previous teachers to help us find wisdom, right? It's connecting all down through the line. So, yeah, so personally, I like to interpret it as, I want to read, so it's some text that I wrote for another thing, um, as hinting to the eternity that is within all of us, right? That within all of us, everything resides that the eternity, timelessness is within every single one of us. Might not be easy to, you know, to intuit or, you know, listen to, or I don't know how to put words to it, because as soon as we put a word to it, it is no longer the truth, right? Because as soon as it has this, it's come out here. How can it be the truth any longer? You know, it's Un, impossible to put words to any of this um, because then it becomes the realm of prakriti right of man of human so it's beyond our personal purusha and touched by the part of us that is connected to all others humans and non-humans so this is my personal way of interpreting i'm not saying it's the right way um, but I really feel like there is a part of us that when we go deep inside, we feel, we, we start to lose the sensation of our, our borders, you know, our borders of our skin. And we feel like we are merging with the place around us. But then at the same time within, there is this expansion. It's like the trying to meditate on what infinite is and what um, finite is. What is infinite and what is finite, right? Try to meditate on that for a while. I don't know, <laughs> nothing comes up. Like there's no, you can't answer those kinds of questions. So um, it's the part that never dies and it's the part that is forever free. So it is unlimited by time, and it is also the wisdom that we all hold. It's the same wisdom that the ancients hold, held, right? So our own deep inner wisdom is the exact same wisdom that all the sages held before us. And we, I think that it's really important to trust that. Um, and that, that comes from the divine itself. So that, in other words, it teaches we are all interconnected and we are beyond, beyond time. So something that uh, Ram Das, you know, this teacher who passed away recently, he used to say that all is God in drag. And I love that, you know, like it's all God in drag. I don't know. I don't know how else to say, to describe it, but that just resonates with me. Um, and so as my commitment is to try to find our way to use the sutras in daily life, 
I think somehow connecting to this, personally, I feel like it takes the pressure off. Because we feel, some of us can feel like I'm one of those people that would, holds the world on my shoulders, you know, like trying to fix the world, trying to fix everything, like, you know, and at some point we need to say we can't fix everything and it's not my job to fix everything. All I can do is follow my own little path and do my best on in my little world and after that there's something divine that is taking care of everything even if it doesn't seem like it because i know when i first heard those teachings whoa that caused so much conflict inside me i felt my solar plexus just like getting all rumbled up because i certainly didn't want to hear anything like that um and especially when you have kids, I don't know, like when, when you're, you have kids, the last thing you want to hear is that you can't control their destiny, you know, because you want to be the best mom ever to give them the best life ever. And you don't want them to ever experience any kind of pain and, you know, but the reality is all you can do is do your best to give them the best that you can give and then you let go, right? And so this is the teaching in everything. If you're going to give a yoga class, all I can do tonight is give you my best. Sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm off, <laughs> right? Sometimes I say stupid things, sometimes I say less stupid things. But all I can do is give the best and then I let go. That's why I never rewatch my videos <laughs> because if I rewatch it, oh my God, I'll be so critical about everything, right? So thinking about things like dealing with the current events, you know, COVID, all I can do is try to stay safe, right? Try to keep others safe. And then out, after that, it's out of my hands or all the racial divide and, uh, you know, the, um, the, the tensions around this racial divide. All I can do is study and try to understand what is it to be a white person and try to go into my self study. And then that's all I can do. I can't cure the world of racism, right? I can do my part, but I can't cure it. Right? Because so because otherwise we just feel like, oh my God, do you ever feel this? Like it just feels so heavy and we need to lighten that load a little bit. Right. So on a daily in my daily life, I think this is how I can interpret these teachings of these few sutras um, and really trusting that there is a wisdom. There is a wisdom behind all this. Maybe the wisdom of COVID was to bring all this out, right? It brings, it shakes things up, right? To make change. You have to, we're not, if everything is too easy, we're too contented, right? It's just all happening. You know, we're not going to get shaken up. Sometimes we get need to get shaken up to wake us up and see, oh my God, we need to deal with this, right? And so maybe all these so-called negative things were there expressly to shake us up. You know, it's hard to say things like this, but even the, you know, the recent killing of this George Floyd, you know, I know that it might sound really cold, but maybe that was needed on some level to make everybody go, oh my God, what have we been doing here, right? And then, wow, right? That's going to get me emotional if I talk about it because I can't even talk about his, you know, that video. It's too, it's too sad. Um, so maybe we are, you know, yeah, we need to find, we need to understand that we can't see everything. Okay, so that. And then also there's a part of Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya, swadhyaya uh, wisdom, action. These three words. Swadhyaya is self-study. I need to go inside and I need to study myself to see how I am 
reacting in that world so that it's going to bring some wisdom to myself. So we can't misunderstand this as complacency. Okay, so just to clear that up, just in case somebody might be thinking, oh, so you're just saying to let the divine take care of everything? No, 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 because we are the divine. And so we need to go inside and figure out how we deal with all of this. Okay, so it's not to be misunderstood as complacency. Okay, Whew. God, can't believe I got through that one. <laughs> this was a hard one for me. Okay, so we're going to do a little meditation. So come to sit. We're trying to sit in a way that you can feel steady. So allowing the pelvis to feel heavy, allowing the legs to feel heavy, and growing out of this base. So at the same time as feeling grounded, connected to the earth. We want to feel light. Feel the, I usually feel like it's the torso, the thoracic cage, the head that feels that sensation of lightness and openness. So that we have the balance between groundedness stability, boundaries, but also open, light, free. And then starting to feel the inner vibration, noticing that inner vibration. Starting to notice the breath. And as always, not judging, just recognizing what is actually there. Now we're going to try to calm that vibration, calm that breath. By starting to control the breath, by making the breath a little deeper. You can use the ujjayi. We'll make the inhales and the exhales the same length. So if your inhale is a count of six, exhaling to the count of six. And then slowly letting the sound become quieter and quieter. So 
And let the breath that comes more and more imperceivable to our focus goes away from the breath. We know it's happening. It becomes so calm that it's almost like we're not even breathing. Less and less movement with the breath. Less and less identification with the breath. We can see if we can bring our awareness to the brain stem, so the back brain. And if we're going to be able to observe the thoughts, but from a distance, so there may be thoughts passing through the front of the brain, like around the forehead, behind the forehead. You know, you know, we might feel this little sense of electricity. So we're going to see if we can allow them to be there and not give them any attention. As we just don't pay any attention to the thoughts, maybe they start to dissipate, thin out. And maybe you can feel some sensation on this area between the eyebrows that's connected to this part of the very bottom part of the skull, the occiput inside there where the brain stem is. Maybe you feel some sensation there. Yogananda calls this area the mouth of God. And then see if we can feel this sensation deep in the heart center. sensation of your essence. The I eyes, so not the I that identifies, but your true essence. Beyond the identifying mind.
Bring the palms in front of the chest. You can chant Om. Inhaling. Thank you. Thank you for being there. So the, the next two weeks I'm not there because we're doing teacher training and I just think it's going to be a bit too much talking for me all day long and then have to do this in the evening. The next, the next sutras, if you look ahead, are going to be about OM. So it'll be, so we'll skip two weeks and then I come back. So if you, if you want to join me, I'll be really happy to have you there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. It's the one where we live. We do the one in Paris only in August. And so this is in Golf Juan, which we do in two parts. And so it's the second half that had to be canceled because it was normally in um, April, I think it was, March, or maybe it was March. No, I think it was, oh yeah, it was March. It was March. Yeah, and so we had to postpone it. Yeah, and so now it's gonna be interesting teaching real people because I mean teaching real people for a while <laughs> you know three months of teaching screen actually I had a private lesson wait I'll touch this shut this off